Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Cancer of the prostate gland. Now, other than skin cancer, it is the most common cancer in men. In the year 2020, it's estimated that there will be about 190,000 men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer in this country and about 33,000 deaths caused by prostate cancer. So it's, it's a bad disease and affects a lot of gentlemen in this country. But most men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer don't die from it. Now, that's the good news. That's right. There are more than 3 million men in the U.S. who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer at some point, and they are still alive today. Joining us in studio to talk about cancer of the prostate is Mayo Clinic urologist, Dr. Derek Lomas. It's nice to meet you. Yes, thanks for having me, guys. It's good to have you on the program. So uh, as I recall, you were a resident here at Mayo Clinic, and then you took a year or two and did additional training in what? Correct. So I, I trained here in urology, and then I was a Mayo Scholar for a year, so I got to travel around to various institutions to, to pick up skills. I spent six months in London in the UK training in uh, image-guided diagnostics and, and prostate biopsy, as well as focal therapies for prostate cancer. A pretty exciting time, wasn't it? Yeah, very much so. So what did you learn about prostate biopsies? What, what has changed? Well, uh, the traditional way we biopsy uh, prostates in the United States is with what we call a systematic transrectal biopsy. Uh, in this approach, in, in a man that we found to be at potentially elevated risk for, for prostate cancer, we've recommended a biopsy. We use an ultrasound probe, which is put in the rectum, and then we systematically, but kind of randomly, uh, direct 12 biopsy cores throughout the prostate, usually six on each side. Don't want to miss anything. Uh, correct. But inherently, you will. Um, you know, the chance of you finding prostate cancer on uh, the first time biopsy in a man is probably about 30 to 40 percent. That doesn't mean the remainder don't have prostate cancer because you might have missed it. Um, so one thing we've been doing here for a number of years, and uh, I expanded on my experience with that over in London, is um, MRI guided biopsy. So using imaging to find a specific part of the prostate that looks abnormal, and then biopsying that area. In many cases, we're still doing the systematic cores to kind of complete out the biopsy, but adding car, uh, cores directly to where we see the MRI is abnormal. Um, the difference in the UK uh, was they were doing it transperineally rather than transrectally. What that means is instead of passing the needle through the ultrasound, through the rectum, through the rectal wall, into the prostate, uh, the needle's going directly through the skin behind the scrotum. Skin can be cleaned much easier than the rectal wall. Uh, my mentor over there would call uh, the transrectal biopsy the transfecal biopsy. <laughs> um, so, you know, carrying in some of that uh, uh, bacteria into the prostate can lead to uh, infection and a severe infection called sepsis uh, might impact upwards of 3% of, of men undergoing biopsy. Now, while that doesn't sound like that high of a number, if you think of the numbers you just quoted about prostate cancer, all those men had biopsies. Many more men had biopsies to rule out prostate cancer, and those numbers add up. The cost of admissions, that could be potentially life-threatening. Uh, by doing it through the skin, you know, we're talking maybe one out of 500 men might get something like that. So much lower. So have we changed the way that uh, this is being done at Mayo Clinic because of what you learned? I certainly have. I'm a convert. Um, in the UK, um, you might have heard of Brexit happening. Mm -hmm. I'm leaving the European Union. And on the urology side, there was Trexit, uh, leaving transrectal <laughs> uh, to kind of coincide with it. And a number of hospitals were posting when their Trexit date was. And, and that's my, my goal for Mayo. It seems like a no-brainer, actually. It does. So um, since coming back, outside of a, a very few isolated clinical scenarios, I have not done a transrectal biopsy. Um, I've done probably several hundred now of the transperineal. Um, my other two partners in my group uh, in the outpatient practice have started to convert their practice over. Um, and the ultimate goal would be to phase out the transrectal. You're you know. teaching the old guys. You have new <laughs> tricks. That's uh, good. How do you decide who needs a biopsy? Well, we have a number of tools. Uh, historically, it's been PSA, that's prostate-specific antigen. That's a blood test that many men get as part of screening for prostate cancer. If that's elevated or rising, that should trigger discussion for a biopsy. And then a physical exam, examination of the prostate uh, through the rectum, if feeling any lumps or bumps, uh, could also trigger a biopsy. Historically, if you had either of those, it would be boom, on to biopsy. But uh, times are changing. Um, we now have prostate MRI, which is very good at um, 
both finding areas that look suspicious, but also helping to rule out potentially prostate cancer. Um, so that the MRI scan is very accurate. Uh, it it's, has very good negative predictive value, so very good at ruling out prostate cancer. If I get an MRI on a patient that's maybe borderline and the MRI is clean, I will many times avoid the biopsy. Um, if it shows me something, it's not a slam dunk that it's prostate cancer. Uh, we have to go in and biopsy and still get tissue. So we can't make a diagnosis of prostate cancer based on imaging, but it raises a suspicion and more importantly, um, tells us where to aim the needles instead of 12, you know, kind of spaced out Scatter cores. shot. And areas of the prostate that we wouldn't hit well from the rectum, the top of the prostate, the tip of the prostate, uh, if we know where to aim and we're doing it through the skin, we can hit those areas very well. So you're much more accurate than you used to be in, in getting a diagnosis. I think so. Yeah. And then what happens if it's positive? Well, if it's positive, it's... Um, Prostate cancer is a spectrum of disease. You know, you mentioned earlier that just because you get prostate cancer doesn't mean you're gonna die from it. In fact, most men won't die from their prostate cancer. Um, we group patients into what we call risk categories. The primary driver of your risk category is the uh, what we call the Gleason score. It's a score a pathologist gives uh, to the cells uh, when they look at it under the microscope. And for, for various reasons, these scores go from six to 10. Um, six is generally low risk prostate cancer. There's other factors that go into that as well. Seven is an intermediate or middle risk prostate cancer and eight or higher is typically a high risk. Like I said, PSA, physical exam, other things can factor into that. In general, men with low risk prostate cancer, the favored treatment at this point is surveillance, watching them closely to see if their prostate cancer maybe behaves more aggressively in the future or if it's going to be a prostate cancer they're going to die with rather than die of. Is it getting easier for patients to do that as as more people are being, you know, we're going to watchful wait kind of thing? Yeah, and and I'll clarify here. So watchful waiting is a is an, another term used. That's kind of an older term mm -hmm. because uh, it's watchful waiting is you have cancer we know about it, we're just gonna leave it alone, forget about it. And you might do that if you incidentally or, or find prostate cancer in an 85 year old gentleman with other diseases. You might say, forget about this, never look again. Uh, but in a younger man, it's really active and it's really surveillance. So we are talking uh, frequent PSAs, usually every six months to start, a repeat confirmatory biopsy, typically at about a year to make sure that we didn't miss an area and then we confirm that it's still low risk. And then if they haven't had an MRI, getting an MRI to make sure that fits. Um, so uh, patients are getting more comfortable when we can give them more information and more tools. And we can share the data that, um, you know, if we find something, we move you on to the treatment pathway. And we really haven't found that it negative in negatively impacts your overall survival or cancer-specific survival. And in fact, um, looking at the big series, maybe a third of men, uh, up 10 years, maybe even a half, might go on to having something, but they've avoided that many years without any treatment-related side effects and were able to still treat with curative intent at that time. So you ca uh, categorize these gentlemen into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk, and that helps you to determine what the appropriate treatment would be. Correct, and how quickly we need to act. Um, generally, most urologists will treat intermediate risk or higher, but it's all in context of the patient's situation, their overall health, their goals, um, and so forth. All right. Our guest is a prostate expert urologist, Dr. Derek Lomas. Well, we've talked about screening exams. We've talked about prostate biopsies. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about treatment options, including focal therapy. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Our topic, prostate cancer. Our guest is a Mayo Clinic urologist, Dr. Derek Lomas. Now we want to talk about uh, treatment options. And I know there are a multitude of them. And it's radiation and it's surgery and it's limited surgery. Uh, how, you how do you make the decision? You sit down with the patient who has the cancer and go over all the options and the two of you decide together what's best? Uh, absolutely. It's really a patient-centered discussion. Um, they certainly have a, uh, a choice in what treatment they want, if any. Um, but we use a lot of the data we've obtained during the, the diagnostic pathway to help us uh, make help them make that decision. So uh, looking at their risk category, um, looking at the features of the, the pathology, looking at the imaging, looking at their overall health, 
looking at their current levels of function, uh, whether that be from a urinary standpoint or a rectile standpoint, because those are things that are going to get impacted with various treatments. Uh, in general, um, when you look at the guidelines, specifically guidelines for the American Urological Association, um, for intermediate risk or high risk prostate cancers, the standard of care treatments are radical prostatectomy, which is removal of the prostate gland, as well as lymph nodes around the prostate. We sew the bladder back to the urethra to maintain the urinary function. And uh, radiation therapy, and there's different uh, ways to give that external beam, proton, brachytherapy seed implants, usually in combination with hormone treatment. And those are really the mainstays of treatment. Um, adding to that, uh, there's increasingly interest um, in this country, and especially in Europe, for using focal treatments of the prostate. And to kind of put it into context of what might be happening in other diseases, if you think about kidney cancers, it's now common practice if you have a small kidney cancer to do a partial nephrectomy where the urologist removes only the portion of that nephrectomy kidney. Nephrectomy meaning remove the kidney. Yep, only the portion, a portion of it. Yep, <laughs> portion of the kidney that contains the cancer. Or in breast cancer, maybe a lumpectomy, removing the whole, removing the tumor, but not the whole breast. And um, very few solid organ malignancies remove the whole organ for, for just a tumor. So in prostate, um, that's the idea behind focal therapy. To and does that have less complications as, a, as opposed to remove radical prostatectomy? Absolutely. Since we are able to treat uh, an area or the half of the prostate that has the, the tumor, we're able to stay well away from uh, the nerves that run along the side of the prostate that help with erections, especially on the other side that we're not treating. And then near the tip of the prostate is the urethral sphincter, which helps hold urine. And um, in many cases, we're able to stay away from that as well. So less incidence of incontinence and erectile dysfunction with that's, focal therapy that's what as opposed to sure. radical prostatectomy. Correct. This kind of sounds like what is happening with the thyroid. Like mm -hmm. instead of taking the whole thyroid out, we just take out the partial thyroid. But then the part of the thyroid that's left or the part of the prostate that's left isn't that then still at risk of developing prostate cancer? It is, and, and that's why we have to follow these patients very closely. So if you were to have your prostate removed, the follow-up is fairly straightforward. Your PSA blood test, PSA is only produced by the prostate, your PSA should go to zero or undetectable, and then we can follow that. If it starts creeping up, that could either mean disease is maybe coming back or maybe there's just a little piece of normal prostate still in there. So it's simple, and, and radiation has come up, radiation oncologists have come up with um, criteria of what, for what they mean uh, for recurrence. In focal therapy, it's, it's more challenging because there's um, different degrees of focal therapy, whether you're just treating the lesion itself with a little bit of margin or area additionally around it, whether you're treating the half of the prostate, a quarter of the prostate. So there's no set PSA number that things are going to go to. So we really have to do an indiv individualized patient trend find out what the PSA goes down to, typically checking every three months for the first two years or so. We have to do imaging with MRI. Um, here, we typically do it every six months for the first two years, but there's various protocols. And then also a confirmatory biopsy generally at one year after treatment uh, of the area we treated as well as the other side, because if someone were to fail, we want to be able to pick that up early and move them on to the tr uh, whole gland treatment um, without many negative effects. Now you have, I presume, haven't been doing this all that long, but the, the question is, what's the recurrence rate? That, that's the concern. Absolutely. So there's various definitions out there, and every paper seems to use a different, different definition of what failure is after focal therapy. The most common definitions are uh, finding clinically significant prostate cancer, Gleason 7 or intermediate risk or higher in the area that you treated, or the patient moves on to either a, a whole gland therapy or cancer spreads or they die of the cancer. Very uncommon that a patient would die from the cancer after uh, focal therapy. But a um, large um, study out of the UK at the centers I trained at found that at five years, about 88% of the men met that definition for failure-free survival. Um, the 88 percent 88 percent pretty good pretty good now that does allow that study did allow for a repeat touch-up focal therapy um, and about a quarter of men got that um, now just a few days ago in the journal of urology there was another study out of france which the numbers weren't as favorable at five years they said maybe 50 to 60 percent of men went on but i think that highlights the wide variety in techniques and you know it's not clear from their study how 
how they were treating, how hyperfocal the equipment was different. So there's a lot of variety out there, and we and we just need uh, more data. But what's clear is that if we do find these patients um, recur, we can move them on to another treatment, usually without any other uh, any greater difficulty of doing a surgery or doing radiation, and still overall survival from cancer standpoint is fine, uh, is good. And um, the majority of the patients don't move on to that. So, so if they do get a recurrence, though, even though you might uh, detect it fairly early mm-hmm. on, isn't there a risk that that prostate cancer could spread elsewhere before you get it out? There is, but that risk is low on the order of a, a few percent and really hasn't been um, significant in the studies. So what you're saying is that when men get uh, cancer of the prostate, it rarely involves the whole gland. There's, it's usually just a part of the gland, and you can use focal therapy to just treat that. Um, in some men. So that, that highlights the importance of patient selection. Not every man with prostate cancer can get focal therapy. The ideal patient has maybe one tumor in on one side of the prostate. I want the MRI to match up with my biopsy data, so my targeted cores that I aimed at the lesion should be positive. There might be a few systematic or random cores on the same side of the prostate, but if they have cancer on both sides or in multiple spots, then they're probably better off with a whole gland gland treatment. So not everyone's able to get this, but in a properly selected man, uh, it's a good treatment. All right, and let's compare the the three with regard to the the complications that every man fears. That is erectile dysfunction and incontinence. So let's compare radical prostatectomy, uh, focal therapy, and radiation therapy. Sure. So um, lowest complication rate, uh, so erectile dysfunction and incontinence is with focal therapy. In in the studies, large studies of HIFU, which is high intensity focused ultrasound, one way we treat prostate uh, with focal therapy and cryotherapy, freezing of the area of the prostate. Mm -hmm. Um, Incontinence rates have been less than 1% with HIFU with a focal treatment, less than 5% with cryotherapy. Um, Erectile function rates, about 15, dysfunction rates, about 15%. Uh, or less. Now even this, with focal therapy? Even with focal, but this depends a lot on patient selection. Um, if you're treating mainly older men, then they're going to have worse outcomes. If you're treating mainly younger men, they're going to have better outcomes because they have more reserve to begin with. If you look at erectile dysfunction with um, surgery or radiation, maybe you're talking 25 to 30 percent. Really? Men. That high? Um, and, and that's across everyone. You know, if you do it in a, a surgery in a 50-year-old, uh, he has a much lower chance of developing erectile dysfunction because he has more reserve. If you do it in an 80-year-old, uh, probably 50% of them are going to have worsening erectile function. And the same goes for, for continence. Um, so definitely lower lower rates um, with focal treatment. All right, so you got lots of options for treatment. That's good to have. That's right. Well, one in nine men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during his lifetime. Prostate cancer can be a serious disease, but most men diagnosed with prostate cancer fortunately don't die because of it. Screening is important, right? If you catch it early, you've got a better chance of being cured of the disease. Mm-hmm. And it's good to know that there are multiple treatment options these days, including focal therapy. Absolutely. Our guest, Urologist Dr. Derek Lomas, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure.